Welcome to the Woman Warriors Podcast, where we're working to help you call a truce with your anxiety. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Now, here's your host, Elizabeth Cush, LCPC. Welcome back to the Woman Warriors podcast. Happy New Year. I hope you had happy holidays if you were celebrating a holiday over the last couple of weeks. I'm excited to get back into the podcasting swing. I took about a month off, which I have never done before, so it was nice to have a break, but I'm excited to be back. I have some awesome guests that some I've lined up to interview and some that I've already recorded, so I look forward to sharing those with you. 2020, it's kind of crazy to think about a decade ending and a new one beginning, but um, I hope that this next year is a good one for all of us. I'm super excited about my guest today. I hope that you all will enjoy the conversation as well. Today, we are talking to Deirdre Fay, who is a licensed clinical social worker who integrates traditional trauma and attachment therapy with over 40 years of meditation and yoga practice. She's the author of Attachment-Based Yoga and Meditation for Trauma Recovery and co-author of Attachment Disturbances in Adults, and she's the originator of the Becoming Safely Embodied Skills. Deirdre has pioneered using the internet to teach ways to heal trauma and attachment by creating an international community. A former supervisor at the Trauma Center, previously a sensorimotor psychotherapy institute trainer, teacher of compassion-focused therapy, certified in internal family therapy, and a qualified trainer in mindful self-compassion, Deirdre is a respected international teacher and mentor for working safely with the body. Let's jump right in on my conversation with Deirdre. Hi, Deirdre, and thank you so much for being a part of the Woman Warriors podcast. And I'm laughing at myself for not hitting the record button. So here we go on our reset. And I would love it if you could tell the audience a little bit about yourself and why you do the work that you do. Well, I'm thinking that we're all warriors. You know, that this, is, <laughs> this is the process of being in life, right? Where we do something, it's not quite right, then we have to do it again. And that's so cool, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess that's how I learned how to do what I do is making 20,000 mistakes. And instead of getting bogged down in it and feeling terrible about myself, it's realizing that each of those times I did something wrong, it was about learning how to do it differently, better. You know, mm. each time it was orienting me in a new direction and the direction I wanted to go into yeah. rather than into the old embedded pathway of I'm terrible, I'm wrong, I'm no good. And, mm. Yeah, which I think yeah. for, for women, well, men too, but I think particularly women tend to carry around that very harsh inner critic often. Right. Yeah. And that can, I know it led me to a lot of anxiety until I sort of learned how to better address that critical voice. Yes. Because yeah. it sure can take us down. And one of the things I've, I've learned really in researching and thinking about and training people around attachment is that those parts of us that are trying to take us down are it's only because they that's the only way they know how and that we get so caught by those negative voices that we fail to hear the call for something new the the call for a better life or a better way of being yeah, yeah. and I, I i it's hard you know one of my sufi teachers actually helped me with this in that instead of getting caught by the blocks of my life it was about how to move around those blocks as he would say like water around boulders in the stream mm. wow and 
And that, and you know, it's a little bit contrary to what we learn in psychotherapy to be a therapist often is to go into the blocks and help undo those. Yeah. But sometimes it's, we're better off learning to a little bit more fluidity. Yeah. Yeah. And sort of allowing them to be there, but Mm -hmm. how do we move past it or around Mm -hmm. it or welcoming them, befriending them? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What I'd love to explore with you today is that I feel as if uh, the word trigger has really kind of come into the everyday language of people like, you know, oh, I'm feeling triggered because they're a little off kilter that day or whatever. Right. Um, But a trauma trigger is a real thing. Like people can't, you know, if you've had trauma in your life, things can make you feel as if you're right back in it, right? Well, maybe we need to have a more robust language because hmm. a flashback is really what has us feel like we're right back in it. True, a, true. A trigger might be something that instigates the process. Hmm. And you know, the problem is, as you so well know, that these things happen so quickly within milliseconds that we often can't catch the genesis of it Mm -hmm. and or watch the rise crest and fall of it so that's what's hard i think the the key thing is for people to realize when our body is dysregulated when it feels like it's way too much than we can handle Mm -hmm. or when there's a sense of fight flight freeze if there's a sense of we're going to die something bad is happening when those alarm bells are going on almost all of those are signals that were triggered Mm -hmm. the question is how can we undo or help dissolve or reroute that energy so that the trigger doesn't have to be always a negative signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I know you spoke, you have written, you know, some blog pieces and a lot of your stuff on your website is written around how to help, you know, how to better recognize triggers, but how might someone know that they're being triggered by past trauma? Right. That's a good, really good question. In the Becoming Safely Embodied Skills course, we do a lot around what noticing that and noticing when you're in the past, when you're in the present, and when the past is invading the present. Mm-hmm. And none of us are immune to that because the past is always invading the present in some way. And yet what we need to learn how to do is to be a master of our own experience so that when we're out of sync with ourselves, when we feel like something's too big for us to handle in the moment, that's a signal that the past is invading us. Mm. And the reason why we get triggered really is because there's some undigested material from the past that hasn't consolidated. Yeah. Yeah. And so when that past stuff comes in, well, let's just take an example. Let's say something really horrendous or scary or doesn't even have to be really horrendous, but something hard, undigestible happened when we were three or five. Mm-hmm. And our mind isn't, um, hasn't been developed strong enough at that point to be able to take in that information, make sense of it, digest it, and then put it into perspective. And so what happens is our body, mind, and heart just absorbs that impact. And because we can't deal with it, it gets encoded in us in some way. Mm -hmm. And then later on in life, something kind of similar, maybe looks like, smells like, kind of in the same way happens. And we are immediately caught by that. And that moment of trigger is a signal to us, if we can catch it, is that something happened, is happening in the here and now that relates to something in the past that's undigested. Yeah. And if we can, and this, I mean, this is the practice of all our lives for all our lifetimes, you know, if I can take what's happening now and activating me and pause and not react and just be with the experience and see if I can find like a lookalike experience from the past. Can I find the genesis? Can I 
see all the many layers of that pattern and how it got encoded over time. Then I have some room inside because the reason, or let's put it this way, my body is responding to the undigested material of the past in the way it was encoded. Right. So I'm right. here in this moment in time, but my body is having a reaction from the past as a way to help process and digest it. Mm. But what, what happens is it bursts into the present moment and we make it about now. We make it about this person or this event or this experience. And so we don't ever get to the healing component, the ability to, to actually pull this trigger out by the root mm. and clear it. Yeah. Does that make any sense, Elizabeth? It does. It makes so much sense. And I love the way you described that, you know, how it bursts into the present moment as if it was happening right now. Right. Because I think for when, you know, I know I've been triggered, I've I've had trauma in my life. And it does feel like whatever the thing is, you know, what whatever you're responding to, it feels so present and mm-hmm. and and until for me, you know, sort of learning mindfulness skills, learning self-compassion skills, like I, I'm able to better notice when it's happening now, but it still sometimes happens. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. One of the key things I say to people is, and I had to do this with myself, you know, in my own healing is when it's so intense is to pause and say, if it's this bad now, it gives me some insight into what it was like back then. Mm. And that allows that perspective taking that we get from meditation. Mm. That allows us to be able to not be fully caught by it, but to be able to have some sense of of where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Well, and to me that, that perspective too brings some compassion with it. Like mm-hmm. if it if it feels this bad now, imagine what it was like when you were three or two right. or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so for you, like what what I know, you know, looking through your website and I've gotten some of, you know, I subscribed to your email list, so got some of your free content. But I how can people who have experienced trauma that think maybe they're having, you know, getting triggered in their adult life, what are some of the things they can be doing to kind of help themselves, you know, whether they're in therapy or not, which I always advocate for therapy because it's going to be so (laughs) helpful. Because it's proven to make a difference, right? Yeah, yes, yes. And I'm a therapist and in therapy myself, so I know it works, Mm -hmm. but... um, yeah, but what might be, I know you talk about the the becoming safely embodied skills. Like I, I, I wonder if you could share some of what that's like. Sure. Well, you know, um, I created back, boy, when I was, this would have been in the 90s, I was uh, working and supervising at Bessel van der Kolk's Trauma Center. Mm-hmm. And he asked me to lead groups. And I thought, well, what am what I would lead on is um, the similar learning, the similar skills that got me um, out of my mess. Hmm. So I, that's when I created the Becoming Safely Embodied Skills. And they are very simple, practical skills to take people on a step-by-step path to um, understand what's happening inside rather than just being overwhelmed all the time. Hmm. And then Janina Fisher, who was, uh, is my friend and colleague and whose office was down the hall, she and I co-led them for years. She kept finding that her clients were getting better faster. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted to know what the heck was I doing with them? And so, in you know, we just kept expanding them over and over and over again. Yeah. But people who are interested in those, you can get a free guide, which um, at dfay, D-F-A-Y dot com backslash safe guide. Okay. And that gives you some information and walks you through. And, you know, the, and the whole point there is to be able to know your own experience inside so that rather than feeling like life is happening to you, that you know 
what you think and what you feel and what's going on and you can respond and react the way that you want. So that that's a huge uh, course that's been going on for decades now and people use it around the world. It's a very satisfying. Yeah, I would imagine. And then we have this other course, the Living Untriggered course, which is really to use the ancient wisdom traditions of meditation Mm. to train the body, mind, and heart to go in the direction you want. And because what happens, as you know so well, is when we're triggered, there's this like powerful energy gets unleashed inside of us and we don't know what to do. And yet those very basic skills of meditation, of learning how to be um, self-compassionate for one, because what's going on is so horrible, being able to train the mind to go where we want it to go instead of where it's, you know, the triggered places are taking it, Mm-hmm. to be able to be mindful about things, to be able to name what's happening so that we can, instead of being triggered, we can we can see and know and feel and sense what's happening inside. And yeah. then the, the tremendous capacity of non-duality, which is so not talked about enough and not taught enough, I think. And it's about how do you find space? It comes from a much clearer place. And so the first part of the practice is being able to uh, be able to sit in the space between the two opposites and realize that there is no opposite, but that mm-hmm. that's a, you know, that's part of what we teach in the course. Yeah. 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 And, and I mean, I have gained so much knowledge about just my own body and where it goes when it's triggered through a mindfulness and meditation practice. And I feel like sometimes it's hard for trauma survivors to meditate. Um, Sometimes eyes closed meditation can be difficult. Right. Do you have any sort of tips about meditating? Sure. Sure. Um, In the course itself and we go through it in much more detail and people often talk about that. And certainly I know from my years of meditation and healing that it can be hard, but you know, simple things like the traditional teachings are that you close your eyes, you sit inside and you sit silently in one position with your spine erect for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case. But even if you can be mindful of what's going on outside, noticing, just a simple act. If you look at something, you see blue and you just see blue without adding anything else to to it. That is a practice of mindfulness. Now you can do that in five seconds. And what we know in the research, the neuroscience research is that if we focus on that one thing for, I think it's 17 seconds or 20 seconds, and we stay just with that for 20 seconds, we begin the process of training our neurons to jump in a new direction. Wow. Now, what that means is we have to do that multiple times a day. So <laughs> if we took that, say, 30 seconds, and we did that, you know, 50 times during the day, we are beginning to train our nervous system, our mind to go in a new direction. Mm. And that is essential, you know, or the capacity of concentration, being able to train the mind to focus on one thing rather than the thousands of things that are facing, you know, going for a walk and being able to just walk and not in a slow, even a slow, like in walking meditations, we teach about this slow. It might just be walk one step, another step, another step, singing, another powerful way to practice Mm. a concentration practice. This is where the spirituals from years ago were so powerful for people. Yeah. It, there's not a right way. The The power of meditation is that there's, as Rumi said, hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. Mm, I love that. So don't get locked in, you know. Um, and if a teacher tells you there's only one way, that's just not true. It's just yeah. not true. Yeah. You know, the breath is another way, but the breath is scary for people because people feel like if it's like an affect regulator. I don't want to breathe too much because I'll have too much feeling. But how do you learn to take a thimble full of breath? You know, how do you learn how to, to see what it, if the breath is easier if you inhale and you hold it gently and softly at the top of the inhalation or you relax the breath and you hold it out 
softly at the bottom of the exhalation, maybe that helps your body re-regulate. Only you will know, but it's how to take practices and make them so small and so you're attending to them so much that you learn from inside what your very next step will be. Mm. That's, that's a lovely thought. That is such a nice uh, way to frame that. And I, um, I wanted to read something from your website because it just touched me. Because I think sometimes when we're feeling triggered or overwhelmed or not enough, that it's hard, it's hard to approach the difficult stuff. But you say, it was in one of your blog posts, um, from recently, I think, and it says, when we are in our vulnerable hearts, when we make peace with our patterns, we integrate what's disconnected so we can live more fully alive. And I feel like that's sort of what you're talking about now mm. is that like we're really learning how to live in ourselves more fully and with more awareness. Right. And I guess I'm on a mission to... You know, it, there's this idea that, and we all have it because when it happens, you know, it take, knocks us down to our knees, is that trauma is a terrible thing. And, you know, please don't misunderstand me. Trauma is a terrible thing. But the power and the opportunity is always that that trauma is meant to open a doorway to a whole other way of life, a much better life. I think of it as um, that trauma is a modern day compassion training. Hmm. You know, it's training of our body, mind, and heart to move in a new direction, to move not in the pain and suffering, but to be able to be with pain and suffering in a different way. Because we will all have pain and suffering. There's yeah. no escape. <laughs> right. I hate it myself, but it's the truth. Yes. Yes. It is just part of, of living for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that my trauma has shaped me in ways that, yeah, I mean, it's made me the, the type of therapist that I am. So mm -hmm. there, there's something in that for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, Deirdre, I just, I know, uh, I just really appreciate that you've taken the time to talk to us today. Um, how do people find you and all of your great resources there on your oh, website? Oh, that's so great. Thank you. Um, there's many different ways. I have, uh, I try to, although I just realized I didn't do a Facebook Live this week, but I'm usually on uh, Facebook once a week on okay. Wednesdays at noon. And uh, it's uh, facebook.com backslash healing attachment. And there's also... Um, my regular website is dfay, D -F -A -Y, dot com. Okay. And people can, there's a ton of material there and people can, you know, just browse through. And there's also a link there to get on my website. More interesting ways to get on my mailing list is through dfay.com backslash profile, mm -hmm. which is our attachment quiz you know what's your relationship profile and we have had that shared thousands of times and people find it so helpful so there's that as a way that's dfa.com backslash profile oh awesome and then we also have the the safe guide which is dfa.com backslash safe guide and then there's another way if you want to know more about triggers that's dfay.com backslash solution. Awesome. So those are many, many different ways to the same source, but it's all about giving you as much free content as I possibly can, you know. Yeah, there is, there's so much on your website, which is amazing. It's such great, great, a great resource. Well, I will provide all of those links in the show notes for this episode. And again, I just wanted to thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. Total pleasure. I love what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining me in my conversation with Deirdre Fay. Um, she really does have a ton of resources on her website both free and paid material that you can find in the show notes. I will put all of her links there. 
We started the conversation. She was so into her introduction about herself. And I looked over at my computer and saw that I had not pushed the record button. And she was kind enough to start the interview over. So I am very thankful for her. It did cut our interview short a little bit, but I still think we got to the meat of the material, you know, talking about triggers and why as trauma survivors, we might get triggered in ways that feel overwhelming. And yet through mindfulness, through meditation, through tuning in and being with our experience in the moment, we can help ourselves recognize that and take care of ourselves in those moments, but recognize that this is something that's coming up from the past, something that needs healing and going about doing some of that healing internally. So I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I hope you'll check out Deirdre's great stuff. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all back here next week. I hope this week you all have a compassionate, mindful, meditative week. Ciao for now from This Woman Warrior. Thanks for listening and subscribing to the Woman Warriors podcast. Music was written and performed by Andy Cush. If you'd like more information on this episode, you can find the show notes, the resources shared today, and links to the guests' profiles at womanwarriors.com.